Hey everyone, my name is Ken Rose and I'm the CTO and co-founder at OpsLevel. We make an internal developer portal that helps teams quickly deliver quality software. I'm excited today to talk to everybody about production readiness and specifically how to automate this mission critical process so that you can get better visibility, reduce downtime and improve your service maturity. So let's get started. So let's start off by talking a little bit about what is production readiness and why it's important. So production readiness ultimately is the answer to this question, right? Do your production services meet your operating standards? And that involves covering all of the illities, reliability, observability, security, quality, maintainability. And this is important ultimately to prevent downtime. If we ignore these considerations, I posit we will have more downtime. Now, I'm gonna point out that there is no such thing as perfect software. We all know this. I speculate that at some point you are gonna have an incident in your production infrastructure. Things will break. But the goal of us as platform engineers is not to prevent everything that could go wrong, but to minimize the number of breakages in, in production incidents by removing those preventable causes. By preventable, I mean those causes where we've learned painful lessons in the past. Ones where we have experienced an outage, we've done a post-mortem, we've learned lessons, and we've improved our services. But if those improvements don't make it across the rest of our organization or the rest of our company, we'll inevitably waste time and money on fire drills and rework, and we're going to lower development velocity. And the worst case, we risk our company's reputation. So let's talk about production readiness and how we can start to solve these three different sub problems that make up this thing that we call production readiness. So the first sub problem is this idea of a discoverability problem. You have a lot of services, you have a lot of systems, the first step is actually cataloging what's out there. The second is a measurement problem, right? You have to determine what your production readiness model will be and how you're actually going to evaluate it. What are the properties or metrics that you're going to look at? And the final is a cultural problem, right? You can have the best production readiness model in the world, but if nobody in your organization cares about that production readiness, if you don't have the cultural buy-in, you're not going to make headway and it's not going to get done. So let's go through each of those problems. So before you can get your services and systems production ready, there's a prerequisite that you need that's kind of obvious once you think about it. You need to know what services are actually out there. And an automated service catalog is the foundation that you need to get there. You need to know what exists out in production, and you need to know which team is responsible for it. And you need to be explicit with developers about what they are responsible for. So everybody starts that process of building that catalog with a spreadsheet. But obviously, this is not automated. It has a bunch of challenges that I'm showing on the right. So let's not do that. So let's say that you wanted to build a system that could automatically populate a service catalog. Where would you look, right? What are the, the sources that you would look at? Well, there's actually a bunch that are here, right? We could look at Git repositories. We could look to see certain directory structures that correspond to services instead of libraries or look for the existence of a Docker file that, has, that is exposing a port, let's say. We could look at our CI and CD systems every time we deploy something to production that is a service that's going out. We could look, if we're using Kubernetes, we could use a Kubernetes API to, to scrape and look at what things constitute services running in prod. Um, we could look at Terraform uh, if we're defining services there. We can look at our service mesh. One that's not on here is we can look at our cloud accounts. So we have a lot of lambdas. Um, we can look at third-party SaaS tools that we're using. If we have PagerDuty or Datadog or Sentry, typically all these types of monitoring tools you know, have a notion of a service. And depending on the size of your organization, you may not have all of your services in prod in exactly one of these places. So for completeness, you generally need to look at multiple of these sources to build a full and complete picture. Now you have two options, right? You can either build that kind of a thing yourself, or you can buy a SaaS tool that's ready-made. Now I'm not here to try to convince you of which option to take, although I am a founder of one of the leading SaaS options to build a catalog and build an IP. But the point is, you know, if you take nothing else away, spreadsheets and wikis, just they won't cut it to create that service catalog and solve the discovery problem. You need to invest in automation to have an accurate, complete, and consistent catalog. Now let's talk about measurement, right? Measurement here, the measurement problem is how do you automatically evaluate different checks against production standards, right? How do you actually kind of do production readiness? So similar to the spreadsheet that we had for a service catalog, most people start with something that looks like what I have on the right-hand side here, right? It's a manual checklist, and that is fine as a starting point, but you will have challenges with scaling that as your engine organization grows. And there are two primary challenges. The first challenge is data collection, right? A lot of the data collected here is manual. If you're asking humans, if you're asking other developers to fill this in, that's toil. The second is there's actually a lot of effort that's required there. And that effort will be inconsistent among teams, right? What does it mean for data encrypted at rest? Like 
are there certain ciphers that have to be used, right? You might have different humans interpreting what that means in different ways. The second challenge is an evaluation challenge. When should you actually evaluate this checklist? Do you do it before a service goes into production? Like, if so, how much before? Like, if the service is still in alpha, do you run your production readiness then? Do you run it just after it goes GA? What happens a year from now if the service has been in production for a year? What happens if we add new standards? How do we, how do we consistently reevaluate or consistently know if our services are still in compliance with our production readiness list? So let's find a way to automate that so that we can help answer all those questions. And the way to automate this, the way to solve those two challenges is through integrations and codifying thresholds. So integrations, let me go back to the challenges. Integrations solve the first challenge of data collection, and then codifying solves the second challenge of evaluation. So the data collection challenge really comes from integrating uh, various tools and various data sources to be able to pull evidence from those tools and be able to look objectively at sources of, of information, sources of data. Um, I showed here the idea of ops level as a centralized place where all these different tools can integrate. You can build your own system that does as well, but pulling all that context, pulling all that evidence uh, around the contents that your service maturity or your production readiness list needs, that's the first key to automation. Now, the second key to automation is codifying the threshold. So I want to motivate that with this example check here. Here, we're trying to verify that the Ruby version is, is above some min version of 3.0. This greater than or equal to 3.0, that's the threshold, right? And this Ruby version file, the Ruby file, you know, repo, pardon me, repo file, Ruby version is not a satisfied version, train greater than or equal to 3. That Ruby version file is a link to the Git forge. This check is actually evaluating a Git repository directly. And the number 3.0, that's something that is declared greater than or equal to 3.0. That's something that's declaratively stored. This is configuration data, right? This is akin to config as code. And so with these two concepts, we can now automatically evaluate this check whenever we want. Right? And by extending this, not just to look at code and Git, but looking at other sources of truth, like monitoring systems, looking at production infrastructure, looking at CI and CD, you have a fully automatic production readiness model. Right? And you can easily change thresholds. You can easily have new services. And you can have confidence that the system will continuously evaluate your production readiness. Now, a quick aside about just sort of how to model a production readiness list. Because most folks start with a flat checklist and use percentages. So for example, here I have. Uh, 12 checks, four are failing, eight are passing, that's 66%. Is that good or bad? Right? Here I have actually, if I have two services, service A at 66, service B at 72, which one's better? Now you might say, well, service B, it's, it's a bigger number. But you know, what if I were to tell you that service A actually has the, the highest urgency checks fixed and service B doesn't. Service B did a lot of like the nice as, but doesn't have the, the most important ones done. There's no sort of prioritization that comes through when you're just dealing with a flat list that has percentages. So as an alternative, you can take a graduated approach, which involves partitioning your production readiness list into different what we call levels so that each service gets a single score at a particular level. So in this example, I have a production readiness list with three levels, bronze, silver, and gold, and you can have whatever levels you want. And if I was a service owner for this service, I would see that my service is currently in bronze. It is passing all of the checks that are at the bronze level, but it is not passing all the checks that are, the, that are at the silver level. And this, has, this provides two really big benefits, this graduated approach. First, it becomes much easier to compare different services to each other. Services are either bronze, silver, or gold. So if I'm looking at a big list of services, I can see how many are bronze, how many are silver, and how many are gold, versus a much higher granularity, 66 or 72%. The second is this is actually a prioritization function on checks. If I'm the service owner, I know that I should start working on the checks in silver. I should start either enabling auto-scaling or defining the disaster recovery plan, the things in silver, before I try to run a DB failover game day, which is the thing in gold. I have to get to silver before I get to gold. Now, I also wanted to offer some tips to successfully implementing a production readiness or service maturity list. So one of them is that ultimately, uh, it is a prior there is a prioritization exercise you have to go through, right? You have to make hard prioritization trade-offs about what are the things you're going to want to focus on. And it can feel like a big investment up front, but I guarantee it pays dividends over time. A good heuristic you know, to use in terms of figuring out what checks should go at lower levels versus higher levels is that lower level items should be items that are either straightforward for teams to achieve, so you get that nice dopamine hit like, yes, we did this, or they should highlight gigantic areas of technical risk that if they weren't taken care of, it is really like, stop what you're doing and go fix this right now. So some examples of good checks that, go, that should go into a lower level are things like, do your services have an owner? Do they have a readme? Are they emitting logs or are they emitting metrics? 
We don't even care what the value of those metrics are, just is it emitting metrics? Does it have basic observability in place? Now, the final piece of guidance I can offer here is to take uh, the decisions in small pieces. A lot of organizations, when they get started with um, service maturity and production readiness, they have this gigantic end state that they have in mind. They want to get everything in there all at once. They need reliability, they need security, they need quality, they need all this stuff. And that is not a great approach because there's no prioritization, right? Think about how you can sequence your checks, how to roll that out in a production readiness model, right? Think about breaking up large tasks into smaller pieces so it's more palatable and easier for teams to take on. Okay, so at this point, we've talked about how we can automate catalog creation. We've talked about how we can automate production readiness. Now we have to talk about the third problem around culture. And unfortunately, I have not yet found a way to automate this one because this is a people problem. This is not a technical problem. But nevertheless, I do have some tips that I can share about how to build a culture that centers around production readiness. So we don't have a lot of time left, um, but I do want to point out, I have a longer talk on exactly this part on Ops Level's YouTube page, where I go much deeper into how to encourage adoption of production readiness and get that cultural transformation. But the abbreviated form of that is these three steps. The first is that culture starts at the top, right? This is a hard prerequisite. You absolutely need buy-in at the highest levels of your company that all this production readiness work that you're advocating for, everything you're asking developers to do is actually important. And that means getting um, buy-in from your CEO or your CTO or your VP of engineering or your head of SRE, but that cultural change needs strong leadership alignment to work. The second big thing is, is being ruthless on the prioritization step, right? You need to, again, invoke some hard decisions. And those generally should involve other senior stakeholders in your company. It'll involve folks from your product team because there's gonna be a balance between how much work is being put into production readiness efforts versus how much work is going against your product roadmap. As well, you'll wanna pull in folks, subject matter experts from your security team, from your platform teams, from a QA team if you have it, right? You wanna start and create a rubric that is as minimal as possible, it contains items that everybody agrees are critical and important. Now, this is a great time again to loop in your senior leadership team, right? They can help break ties so they can help force prioritization decisions between competing items. And the third thing is that once you finally decided on kind of what's important and you need to actually execute on that production readiness model, a great way to do that is by incentivizing teams. And I wanna talk about different mechanisms that you can use to incentivize teams and kind of accomplish this goal of driving production readiness. So we have seen a, a variety of approaches that work across the customers you know, that we have at ops level. And they vary all the way from small architectures to organizations with thousands of services and engineers. And I'm gonna talk about kind of three different approaches that we've seen work. One of them is a people-based approach, right? Which is you set down um, top-down visibility and goals. So as an example, we want to uh, have an SLA of fixing critical vulnerabilities within seven days. You set that as a goal, teams rally around that goal, they understand that goal, and everybody's working towards that. The second uh, approach is a process-based approach, right? Reserving capacity within your production development, or pardon me, product development schedule, so that a certain amount of time is dedicated towards production readiness uh, initiatives, right? So you might say, we're going to allocate 10% of our time towards production readiness activities, and that way you have that kind of uh, headroom reserved for, for developers to, to go take whatever actions or remediations are necessary. And the final is a system-based approach, right? Integrating production readiness into your software development lifecycle. So some of our more advanced customers will tie in production readiness into their CI and CD process and block deploys so that you can't deploy without approval unless services meet certain criteria for production readiness. As an example here, um, you're trying to deploy a tier one service. We expect tier one services are gold. If you're trying to deploy a tier one service that's silver, you're not allowed to continuously deploy that anymore. You need to stop and go do the work to bring it up or you need manual approval to be able to get it out because you have violated this idea that like tier one services need to be at a certain standard. Now, these approaches can work. Which ones work for you, whether it's one, some, or all of them, really depend a lot on the culture of your engineering organization and what you're trying to optimize for. Um, as an aside though, regardless of which approaches you take, you should always invest in automating as much of the actual work away as possible, right? Make it easy for engineers to improve their systems and just reduce the lift that's required from your developer teams. If you lower the friction to get started, it will always, always help. So we're nearing time here. So just as a recap, right? We talked about automating production readiness and how to solve these three different sub problems relating to production readiness. We talked about the discovery, solving the discovery problem with an automated catalog. We talked about solving the measurement problem with a continuous automated and graduated rubric. We talked about solving the cultural problem by aligning people, process, and systems around that rubric. 
So I'm around on Slack if there are any questions or feel free to hit me up on Twitter if that's still around. I have the same handle on LinkedIn or always by email. Thanks very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the conference.